All right, in this video, I want to explain to you how we make recombinant DNA, which is DNA from two different species spliced together. And then we can use recombinant DNA to make what are called transgenic organisms, meaning organisms that have two, uh, DNA from two different organisms. So the first step in making recombinant DNA is we have to cut up the DNA and isolate the gene we're interested in. So for example, in our lab, we are going to be putting a gene from jellyfish that makes the jellyfish glow into regular E. coli. So the first step would be to go to the jellyfish, extract DNA from the jellyfish, and then through a lot of processes of electrophoresis and radioactive probing and all kinds of stuff, find the gene that codes to make the jellyfish glow. So let's say they have now found the gene that makes the jellyfish glow. So let's just color that in. This is the gene for glowing. Um, we would now need to pick a restriction enzyme. Remember, restriction enzymes from my previous recording cut DNA in specific sequences, and there's lots of different ones. Find one that would cut the DNA and isolate that gene to make the that makes the jellyfish glow. In other words, we can't use the entire DNA of a jellyfish. We need just, we just want this one gene. So we would look for an enzyme that would cut out this one gene. Now that we've extracted the gene, we need to insert that gene into another organism's DNA. In the case uh, of what we're going to do, we're going to be putting that DNA into what's called a bacterial plasmid, which I'll talk about in a second. So this is the plasmid DNA. It's a circle so what we would do is we would use the same restriction enzyme that we used to cut the pe the p glow gene. We would use that same restriction enzyme to cut open the plasmid. And when we open up the plasmid, then we could uh, basically splice together using ligase, the glue from our previous chapter, you should remember, to splice one gene with the other gene. And now what we've created is recombinant DNA, DNA from two different organisms. And then we would put that DNA, make lots of copies of it. We could use PCR to do that. If you go back to um, the PowerPoint, PCR is a technique to make lots of copies of DNA. You should know in general how that works. And then we would insert that modified DNA into our target organism. We could put it into an embryo, um, like they've made glowfish or glowing mice. In our case, we're just going to be putting it into good old E. coli. And the goal is that if our E. coli pick up this modified DNA, they will glow under UV light. So that is an overview of how this would work. All right, so how do we uh, do this? Well, first of all, we usually use what are called plasmids. A plasmid is a circular DNA from a bacteria, but not the regular DNA. In other words, if this is my ginormous picture here of an E. coli bacteria, Inside my E. coli is their regular DNA, which is a big, giant loop of DNA. It's even bigger than that, technically. But usually, a lot of bacteria also have these little circles of DNA. Again, this is hollow. This is DNA in a circle, you know, ATGC in a loop. Um, these are called plasmids. Now, why do bacteria have plasmids? Well, it turns out plasmids have codes for kind of neat little things that, that bacteria can do. One of the most common things that plasmids have codes for is resistance to certain antibiotics. So for example, this plasmid in this E. coli might make this particular E. coli resistant to penicillin. And that's why if you take penicillin and you're infected with like MRSA or one of these bacteria that's resistant, that's why it's resistant. It has a plasmid, a little DNA segment, and it has on it a code for making it resistant to that particular antibiotic. Um, not only do bacteria have plasmids, but a little aside here, Bacteria have, sometimes some of them, have something called a pilus, or the plural is pili, and they can sometimes hook to other bacteria and then pass a copy of the plasmid over. So this is actually not transformation, which we learned about in the last chapter. This is um, actually called conjugation, when two bacteria hook up, basically, um, and one passes plasmid to the other. And now this bacteria would become resistant to that antibiotic as well. And this is how bacterial uh, antibiotic resistance tends to spread, is that bacteria can pass these plasmids to each other. So bottom line, just like how we discovered restriction enzymes originally in bacteria, we've also discovered plasmids. And because plasmids are very small, they're really good for inserting genes and then sticking them into organisms because they're tiny. It would be impossible, even, even just for an E. coli, I can't put a gigantic 
big giant gene into an E. coli. There's no way for me to get it to absorb it and actually get it to work, um, a big DNA segment. But a little plasmid, that would not be that hard to do. We're going to do it in the classroom. So obviously it can't be too hard to do. Um, and so this is why we would specifically use plasmids. We can insert foreign DNA using restriction enzymes. I just drew that out for you, and I'm going to show you a picture of it on the next slide as well. Um, open the plasmid with a restriction enzyme, cut it open, add the DNA segment, seal it with ligase. Remember, that's the glue. And then the plasmid that we've created can be put into another cell. So in the lab, we're going to take the plasmid that, that um, I have for the glowing bacteria, and your goal in the lab is going to try to, try to get the normal E. coli bacteria to absorb this plasmid. That's what your goal is going to be. We're not going to be making the plasmid. We're going to be getting the bacteria to basically eat the plasmid. This is a picture showing the difference between the regular DNA. All of this is all the regular loop of DNA from the bacteria. It's huge. These are plasmids. So they're really tiny, easy to extract, easy to manipulate, add genes to them, stick them back in the bacteria. A reminder, we cut with restriction enzymes. Remember, restriction enzymes leave sticky ends. As long as sticky ends match up, AATT matches with TTAA, ligase will seal this, and we'll basically now get um, a hybrid DNA. All right, and here's another picture. Again, we cut it open, we add the gene, we seal it with ligase. Now you might say, well, isn't it possible when we do this to create a plasmid that these two seal back together? Or this gray one seals with another gray one. I mean, how do you know you're going to get the gray one inserted into the green one? Because ligase is going to glue anything together with the matching sticky ends. Absolutely true. That's why it, that part is the harder part. Because in a lab, we would need to know. If we know what size this should be, we could run an electrophoresis and find the correct size piece of DNA to know which one was made correctly. Um, there's, there's ways of screening it so we would know. Um, this is just another picture showing the same thing, but we're going to move along here. Um, and yet another picture showing the same, same thing. All right, so here's what we're going to be doing in the lab. So the first thing you need to know is a bacteria, if we just mix plasmid and E. coli in our lab, the bacteria are not going to pick up the plasmid. We have to do something to make them competent. Competent is the, is the word for a bacteria that's ready to absorb a plasmid. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to use a technique called heat shock. Um, we had a chemical called calcium chloride. And what that does is it sort of disrupts the cell wall. So if you imagine this is my bacteria, and the cell wall, the bacteria now sort of has little holes in it. Um, and then heat shock, what we're basically going to do is we're going to put the bacteria on ice for, I think, like 15 minutes. Then we're going to heat them in a little bit of a slightly hot water bath for, I think, like 90 seconds, and then back on ice. So we're shocking them. Cold, hot, cold. You wouldn't like it either. And what that's going to do, again, is further disrupt the cell wall, hopefully without killing them, so that they can suck up the plasmid. That's the idea. We then put them on a petri dish, a plate, that's got agar, which is made from seaweed, like just like agarose that we used in our electrophoresis. And 24 hours later, if it worked, we're going to see what are called colonies, little dots. Those colonies are basically clones that all came from one bacteria. Because if you start with one, 20 minutes later you have two, four, and they basically just become this big circle and eventually it would cover the entire plate if you had enough of them growing. But they all came from one bacteria. So if one grows, um, you would know that all of these would genetically be identical to the one you started with because the bacteria just copied by binary fission. They just make exact copies of themselves. So if we can get one bacteria to pick up the plasmid, we'll know that every bacteria that grows from that also has it. This is the hardest part, and this is what you need to be able to do on a test on the short answer, is screening it. So here's the thing. Imagine I go in the classroom and I throw a bunch of candy in the air. Some people might grab five pieces of candy, and there may be a few people that don't get any candy. This is very much the same with the bacteria and the plasmids. Just because I take a vial and I put in it bacteria and I put in it plasmid and I do my technique of heat shock, it doesn't mean every bacteria is going to grab one plasmid. Some may get several, some may get none. I don't want the ones that didn't pick up the plasmid. I'm not interested in those. If I'm trying to create bacteria that make the gene for human insulin, I only want the ones that now have that ability. The bacteria that were unsuccessful, I don't want those. So I need a way to screen it so that I know which ones got my plasmid and which ones did not. There are three techniques or genes we usually use. The first one is an antibiotic resistance gene. In other words, when we pick a plasmid, 
that we're going to use for this, and we're going to put our gene in there. This is the gene, our P-GLO gene that's making GLO. We pick one that already has on it the gene for antibiotic resistance. For example, in the lab tomorrow, we are going to have a plasmid that has the gene for ampicillin resistance. So those bacteria, if they pick up the plasmid, they're going to get both abilities. They're going to get the ability to live in ampicillin without being killed by it. That's an antibiotic. And they're going to have the ability to glow. So this is one way we can screen them. Use a plasmid that will make them resistant to an antibiotic and then grow them in that antibiotic. Our second option is use the a gene that makes them a different color. Then you'll easily be able to pick them out. For example, the ones we're using, again, if we just grew them on regular, uh, if we grew them on regular agar, um, actually in our case, they have to be in the presence of a sugar called arabinose. Arabinose is what's gonna stimulate them to glow. But the bacteria that picked up the plasmid are gonna glow green, and the ones that didn't, they wouldn't be killed, but they would not glow. So you would easily be able to see and choose which ones picked up the plasmid. And finally, you could use a gene that gives them the ability to digest something and then grow them as the only food source is that thing. For example, if you take bacteria that can't normally digest lactose, add a plasmid that allows them to, um, in addition to whatever gene you want to get on there, and then feed them the only food available is lactose, the ones that didn't pick up your plasmid will basically starve to death, and the only ones growing will be the ones that you wanted. Um, so you have to select the proper media, media meaning your uh, the plates that you're going to grow them on, to screen them. Now on the test, you're going to have to be able to do this. So I have three examples. So here's our first one. In our first example, we expose our bacteria. We do our little heat shock. We add our bacteria, and we add a gene for penicillin resistance. First option, I try growing the bacteria on nutrient agar. Now, nu agar is from jelly, uh, sorry, is uh, made from seaweed. Nutrient just means food. The question is, what will grow? Your answer is, they will all grow. This would not screen them. You would have some bacteria that got your plasmid, some bacteria that didn't. Second scenario, I now take my same sample, but I try to grow it on a plate that has nutrient agar, food, and the antibiotic penicillin. Now, only the ones that picked up my plasmid will grow because the other ones that did not pick up the plasmid will be killed by the penicillin. And then, kind of a trick question, what if I do nutrient agar, but I add a different antibiotic, streptomycin? Well, in that case, nothing will grow because my bacteria aren't resistant to that antibiotic. So if I messed up and used the wrong antibiotic, my bacteria would all die. All right, second scenario. I use a gene that makes the bacteria blue in the presence of lactose. First, I grow them on agar. I should have probably put nutrient agar here. So again, I'm providing them with food. They would all grow, and they would all be white. That's the normal color of bacteria. Second scenario, I grow them in agar and lactose. Now, be careful here. Lactose doesn't kill them. Lactose just makes them a different color. So now they would all grow, but I would know which ones picked up my gene because they would be blue because they have a plasmid that makes them blue in the presence of lactose. So everything would grow, but I would see what blue versus white. And in my final scenario here, um, I gave them a gene to digest lactose. Nutrient agar, again, everything will grow. This is the tricky one. Nutrient agar plus lactose. Everything will grow. Why? Because even if they can't digest lactose, if they didn't pick up my plasmid, as long as I'm feeding them other stuff, it's not like the lactose is going to hurt them. They just can't digest it. So they would still grow. Everything would grow. The ones that can't digest lactose would just eat the other nutrients. So if I wanted to screen these, I would have to grow them in uh, agar that had lactose as the only food. Now, only the ones with the plasmid would grow because the others would starve to death because they don't have the ability to digest lactose. All right, and last but not least, uh, cDNA. Bacteria cannot read our DNA because our DNA has introns in it, which don't code for anything. So to put DNA into a bacteria from a eukaryote, we have to cut out the introns. We let the DNA become mRNA and get processed in protein synthesis, and then we use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, and that will make DNA back from our RNA. 
So we basically take RNA that's already had the introns cut out and then make DNA from that. And now we have a DNA segment with...